Amen. Why don't you be seated? Aren't you grateful for our praise team and band? I've answered amen. Amen. I've said to several here today that have appropriately asked, hey, what happened to Timothy? Where did our worship pastor go? Well, well he was in a wedding out of town, and, and even in spite of that, he's also taken a much-deserved and a long-overdue uh, weekend off. And so I'm, I'm grateful for these men and women that invest so much of themselves. They put in more time, more hours than you would ever believe uh, to be able to help lead us to the foot of the cross. And I believe they've once again done just that. Uh, in just a minute, uh, we're going to continue in this time of worship. But before we do, uh, I just want to continue to just kind of lead us as a congregation just in a time of prayer. If your day has been like uh, most on a Sunday morning, you've been kind of go, 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 and you got here, and you look great, and, and you made it on time, but I want to slow down for just a minute, and, and let's just spend some time together. We've worshiped Him in song, but let's also continue to worship Him in prayer. So would you just pray with me right there where you are? Holy Father, as many times as we just sung it, it it's not enough to say thank you that your mercies are more Lord, I just know in my own life, my sins are so many and my sins are so great. And they cover all 56 years of my life. But your word tells us your mercies are still greater. And they're new and fresh every morning. And you are a tender and you are a loving father. And you are a forgiving father. And for that we say thank you. Lord, I know I, know I deserve hell. But you and your love and your mercy and your grace have adopted me as your child into your family and many others in this room just like me. And for that, we say thank you. Father, there's just a spirit of gratitude this morning. As, as I woke up, I know as men and women and young people came into this place, we can't say thank you enough for the freedom that we have in this country to be able to gather in a room like this with absolutely no worries about persecution. Or harm. We say thank you. We say thank you for men and women that are standing right now to defend our great nation and to defend this great state and allowing us to have this freedom to gather as we do. We say thank you for those men and women who stand in the gap. Lord, we say thank you for the very breath that we breathe, the food that we eat. We say thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We say thank you for his death in our place. We say thank you that you didn't allow him to remain dead, but you rose him from the dead on that third day to die never again. Lord, would you just soften our hearts now? Would you open up our ears to your word, not mine? Holy Spirit, would you comfort us where we need comfort? Would you encourage those who need encouragement and maybe just need their spirits lifted just a little bit today? Father, mold us however you see fit. That's our prayer. And it's in Christ's name that we say these things to you. Amen. Hey, before we get started, children, today is that Sunday. We're having children's church. And so if that's something that you want to participate in, moms and dads, you pretty much know the drill. And if you don't, just walk your way right back to our main lobby. And Miss Leanne will be back there for you and get you checked in and registered in for another awesome uh, service today and a, a children's time together. Anybody else need to work their way back? They're slowly but surely getting it done. Hey, church, let me go ahead and give you a little bit of a heads up. At the end of this day today, we're going to observe the Lord's the, the ordinance, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, and we're going to have the kiddos come back in. Will it be a little bit disruptive for a moment? Yeah, it will, but I just really feel strongly that I want our families to join back together. And we have young people in this room who have confessed Christ and who have been biblically baptized, and I think it's important that they get a chance to, to observe and to partake in the Lord's Supper. And maybe for those that haven't yet done that, I always think it's a good thing to see their siblings and their mom and their dad, their grandmom and their granddad their great-grandmama, their great-granddaddy observe this time that we call the Lord's Supper. So just bear with us in just a little bit. Have you got your Bibles? If so, turn to chapter 11. Chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. If it's on your electronic device, tap whatever buttons you need to do. If you're there at home, 
or wherever you may be found watching us on Facebook or on YouTube, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians is where we're going to be today. And what have you learned, if anything, as we've been unpacking this book of 1 Corinthians? I think you've learned one thing. That church in the city of Corinth, they were a mess. Don't you remember this? They were a mess of a church. Uh, we've seen this all throughout, how even all the way back into chapter 1, uh, they were divided. They were a church that literally was split and divided. There was no unity amongst the, the people that was called the church at Corinth. They fought over all kinds of things. They fought over their pastors. Uh, there was sexual immorality that was rampant within the church, within the body of believers. Uh, there was immorality in such a way that, that they didn't just tolerate it, but you may remember from prior weeks, they actually celebrated it. And, and out of a prideful kind of arrogance, they, they said, look how enlightened we are that we even tolerate within our very midst the immorality that we unpacked some weeks ago. But we've seen it in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians where brothers and sisters in Christ, these are Christians, these are Christ followers within a church, were suing each other. When they had disputes that they couldn't get settled, they were going into pagan civil courts and taking each other, <clears throat> excuse me, before a judge to resolve their differences. And apparently the church at Corinth, they were all confused about how to handle their new freedom that they had in Christ, whether they'd come from a Jewish background, and what do we do now about food that's been sacrificed to idols, and how do we handle this thing that Jesus says we're now free in Christ, that the law has been fulfilled? This may seem like kind of a strange question, but it's kind of the way I think, so bear with me. Aren't you glad they were as messed up as they were? Isn't it kind of good to know sometimes that there was a, a body of believers that just were all jacked up and, and seemed to kind of get it all wrong? Uh, maybe it's just the way I operate, but sometimes I like to kind of look around and go, okay, I'm not the only one who struggles with stuff. And, and we see Christ followers all the way back in the days of the church at Corinth who obviously were struggling and who were falling down and were, were maybe at times getting it wrong more than they were getting it right. And we see in our scriptures, whether it was the church at Corinth, whether it was the church at Ephesus, or Thessalonica, or, or Philippi, uh, or Galatia, it's like almost anywhere you turn, you see where Paul, a man inspired by God, has to come in and say, let me correct some things that are going on within this body of believers. Maybe I need to teach you again, or maybe for the first time, the, the way it is that we walk wisely in our relationships with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, guess what else they messed up? The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. As you think about it, it's like, how in the world can you mess up the Lord's Supper, right? It's not that complicated. It's really not a, a terribly complicated or, or confusing kind of thing. What could possibly go wrong with something as simple and beautiful as the Lord's Supper. Or in just a moment, we're going to see in chapter 11 the answer to that question. And we're going to look at Paul's words to the church at Corinth, and I believe also his words to us about this amazing thing that we call the Lord's Supper. Now, I know that not everybody in this room grew up like I did as a lifetime cradle to grave Southern Baptist boy. And so I've always known it as the Lord's Supper, right? Some, maybe in your childhood and in your early faith background, you might have always called it communion. Others in this room may have always called it Eucharist and taking the Eucharist. Whichever of those names has been in your background, these are synonyms. This is what it is that we are doing when we talk about communion, Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. Regardless of the name that we call it, what we're going to see today are three quick things. We're going to see how the Lord's Supper actually connects us with our past, with our forefathers and foremothers, with ancestors many, 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 many generations ago. We're going to connect with them as we observe the Lord's Supper. Secondly, we're going to see today that we don't just connect with our past, but actually right here in the present. We're afforded an opportunity to connect with our Lord in a special and kind of unique way. And then thirdly and finally today, we're going to see that we don't just connect with our past, and there isn't just this amazing thing going on in the present, but actually the Lord's Supper and the way that we're about to partake of it, it connects us with our future. 
in what the Scripture actually teaches us and says about, let me also remind you and get you to focus in on your future. So do you have your Scriptures there? Turn to chapter 11, and I'm going to read kind of a long passage, and then we'll come back and, and pick it apart just a little bit. But looking at chapter 11, beginning at verse 17, Paul is writing, and he says this, In the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you, do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup in the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 27, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Finally, verse 30, this is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Do you see the problems that I just alluded to a moment ago that are going on there at the church at Corinth? In verse 18 and 19, we, we literally see that Paul says there are divisions amongst you when you gather together to do this thing called the Lord's Supper. There's this division between the wealthy or the rich or those who have a lot, and, and they're being separated or they're segregating themselves from those who actually don't. In verse 21, I, I see selfishness there where he says, for an eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, and another one gets drunk. Let, let me just remind you for just a second about in the early church days, the way we observe the Lord's Supper isn't perfectly identical to the way it was done in the earliest days of the church. Uh, in the good old Southern Baptist tradition, if you imagine, even in the service, it's almost like we're having the potluck supper, right? The, the folks would bring their entire meals with them. It wasn't just a piece of bread and just a little bit of wine or, or fruit of the vine, so to speak. It wasn't just that. It was more. There was a meal that was celebrated there. And what we see here is Paul is saying, you know, you folks who are wealthy and you've got a lot, man, you're bringing a feast of both food and obviously of alcohol and wine, and you're not sharing it with anybody. And in fact, you're going on not even waiting for your brothers and sisters, and you're having a heck of a good time, right, to the point where you're getting intoxicated at this time when we're supposed to be remembering the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we have poor folks they don't even have enough to do that. And you let them go home hungry all the time. There are divisions in the church there that we see. There's selfishness that we see. Obviously, there's drunkenness as talked about. In verses 28 and 29, I, I don't know how to describe it any better than to say there's a, a spirit of carelessness that's actually taking place. It's like they really weren't engaged in the moment. They were careless, you see there. They didn't take it seriously where Paul says, you're not even bothering to examine yourself for unconfessed sin. You're not really engaging in this unbelievable moment. You're just kind of going through the motions like it's just something that we happen to do on a given Lord's Day. Class divisions are rampant. Could you have messed it up much more? I, I guess with our imaginations, we could maybe find yet another way they could have messed it up. But the, the church at Corinth, they couldn't really mess it up much more than they already did. And so this is when Paul steps in, as he always does, and he says, I'm going to have to correct this situation. And I'm going to teach you, maybe yet again, maybe for the first time, this is the way it is to be done. Because this really, really matters, church. It matters because of this. The heart of the gospel 
is that you and I are saved by grace. Uh, you, you know this, church. We're saved by grace and grace alone. It, not, none of our works amount to anything. God says, the best of your works are but filthy rags in my, in my sight. It is grace and grace alone that, that saves you. And, and what the gospel says is we are all sinners in need of grace. How could there possibly be division amongst you as though some were without sin and others are full of sin? And so Paul is saying, your pedigree, that wealthy background that you may have, uh, that outstanding education that you may have, that, that so-called high and lofty occupation that you might have, I could care less. That lack of wealth, that lack of education, that lack of so-called sophisticated occupation that you may have, that pedigree or lack of pedigree doesn't matter at all in the eyes of the Lord. See, the gospel means grace, and the gospel means unity, especially within the body of Christ, and especially as we're observing the Lord's Supper. So before we go any further, I'm going to hit these three points, and I'm going to touch upon them pretty quickly, and then we'll move on. The first is this, the Lord's Supper connects us with our past. Think about it. As we think about this Lord's Supper, as we think about the bread, as we think about the juice, it ought to remind you back to that night on which Jesus was betrayed. When we remember that night in which Jesus was betrayed, that was the last meal that he had with his disciples. That was the last supper that he had with his disciples. And do you remember what was important or special about that night? It was a Passover night. You remember? It was a Passover meal. And this Passover meal in Jesus' day would be that one night of the year where that little boy or that little girl would look to his or her parents or grandparents and would ask this question, why is this night different than all the others? And, and then that parent or that grandparent would step up and would say, this night is the night when we recall that great act of the Lord, when he liberated our Hebrew people from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh. And so when we remember the Last Supper, we're actually going back and we're connecting now with our past. We're going back to Exodus chapter 10, Exodus chapter 11, even picking up into Exodus chapter 12. Well, you remember that, that the Hebrews had been enslaved by the Egyptians, and Pharaoh's heart was hard. And the Lord, through his man Moses, said to him multiple times, you need to let my people go. And he sent plague after plague, and nothing was getting Pharaoh's attention. Do you remember in seventh plague, in eighth and ninth. And then finally one time the Lord says through his man Moses, you need to go tell your people to get prepared. You need to let them know that there's a judgment that is coming upon this place. And in anticipation of that judgment, through my man Moses and through my man Aaron, the Lord said, you need to get ready to prepare a special meal. And I'm going to tell you exactly the way you're going to serve this meal and what you're going to wear and how you're going to engage in a very quick way in this meal because there is a judgment that is coming. And so you're going to take a spotless lamb and you're going to take a lamb without blemish and you're going to sacrifice it. You're going to kill it and you're going to prepare it and you're going to eat it. But also you're going to take the blood of the lamb and what are you going to do? You're going to spread it on the outside of your door, there where you dwell, there wherever it is that you may live. You're going to put that blood on the doorposts of your home, and then you are going to take shelter under the blood of the Lamb. Do you see the picture there, church? Do you see the picture that is so beautiful? The Lamb dies so that those within the home do not have to. And our God's name is faithful, and our God's name is true. And if he says something, and if he promises something, he does it every single time. And so that night, the angel of death came over all of Egypt. And, and we see in our Old Testament scriptures where the angel of death passed throughout, and every firstborn was taken exactly as the Lord had said he was going to do, except those where the blood of the lamb was over the door. They were saved, and they were protected the Lord also, though, as you may remember in this amazing story that we have in our scriptures, he didn't just say, you're going to do this and this is what's going to happen, but then he also gave him a command. And he says, I want you to always remember that great night by observing the Passover meal. 
So now jump with me from Exodus chapter 12 back into the last days and hours of Jesus Christ. Here we find him with his disciples gathered around in that great upper room. He's about to be crucified, but he's presiding over this Passover meal, over this last meal. But instead of holding the bread as he would have done and reminding his disciples that this bread is the bread of great affliction, which our fathers and our mothers ate in the wilderness over all those many years, instead of describing the bread this way, Jesus instead says, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. Where's the lamb? Don't you know a faithful and obedient Jew over all those years, these grown men are sitting there thinking, yeah, but where's the lamb? We're supposed to to have a lamb, right? And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, I am the lamb. I am the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus looks at his men and he says, I am the main course. My death is the ultimate act in all of history. All of history climaxes with my death and with my burial and with my resurrection. See, what Jesus is saying to them then and to us today is that all of history points to this moment in time. Every sacrifice, all of the millions of sacrifices that took place at the temple over all of those centuries, every single one of those sacrifices pointed to me, is what Jesus is saying. Every prophet that came before us spoke of me. Every priest that helped lead in worship was pointing to me. Every king that ever served our people, he was pointing you to me. So Jesus comes and he says, tonight I'm not going to just liberate you from slavery. Tonight I'm going to liberate you from sin and from death itself. So when you eat this bread, when you take this cup, it connects us with our past. Do you see this? Second thing that we see here is that the Lord's Supper connects us in the present with our God. Jesus says, this is my body. Jesus says, and in holding up the cup of wine in, in those days, he says, this is my blood. This is the new covenant. And, and we know that this is clearly a symbolic moment, right? It's a symbolic moment when he holds up the bread and says, this is my body. And a symbol of, of his blood when he says, this is my blood. Just as if, if I had a picture of my youngest son, Kyle, and showed it to you and said, this is Kyle. Well, actually, you'd say, no, it's not. This is a picture of Kyle. This is a representation of your son. It's his likeness, right? But it's actually not the body of Kyle. Well, here we see that although these are symbols of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood, I also fully believe and am convinced that there's something mysterious, that there's something mystical, if you will, something beyond what our minds can truly understand that happens every time that we observe the Lord's Supper. See, God promises us, He says, I'm making myself available to you. God says, I'm giving myself over to you. I am connecting to you. See, the Lord's Supper is more than just connecting with our past, but actually in the present, it is communion. Think about that word, communion. Communion, common union. Communion. There is a real union that is taking place between you as a believer in Jesus Christ and your Savior when you observe this Lord's Supper. I believe that there's a real union that takes place in a room just like we're in right here today or when you're gathered with other believers in Jesus Christ. We don't just connect with our Father, which we do, but there's also something where we connect with each other as the family of God as we participate in this very, very real union. We have the joining together of the children who have been adopted by a good and gracious God. Now, y'all all know your church history just enough to know that Catholics and Protestants have disagreed about this for a long, long time. But there's a lot that we absolutely know for certain, and we are utterly convinced of this. As often as we do this, symbolically, we are joining together with the one who died for us. We feed on his words. We feed on his spirit. We, we connect with our Savior by feeding on his gospel. And Jesus says, you need to believe this. You need to remember this. You need to digest this 
so that as you do, it becomes a part of you and you let me just fully saturate who you are. The Lord's Supper connects us with our God in the very present moment. And, and third and finally is this, the Lord's Supper connects us to the future. Now check this out, back into verse 26 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, verse 26, Paul writes, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Until He comes. He, he's thinking now of the future. When He comes again, what is it going to be like? What is He going to bring when He comes? Well, well, the Scripture answers this in part. We don't fully know, but the Scripture does let us know in part what it's going to be like when He comes. In the book of Revelation, where God chose to reveal Himself and His words to, to His disciple John. Remember, John was on the Isle of Patmos, and through visions and revelation, and through a mysterious, only the way God can do things, He showed John things, and He said, I want you to write these things down, because generations to come need to know what it is that I'm about to say. The book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 9 John is writing, and he says, And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. In Revelation 21, he goes on in verses 3 through 5. Remember again, John is writing and speaking, and he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. What is it going to be like in part? At that great time when He comes again, as, as we think of our future as followers of Jesus Christ, in part what the Scripture teaches us is it's, it's going to be like a great supper, a marriage supper between the Lamb of God and His bride, the church. When, when we get to that new heaven and that new earth, it's like an amazing, unforgettable supper. Part of what makes it amazing is it is a perfect supper because there is no pain there is no more sickness there's no crying and there's no tears he says he's going to wipe them away from our eyes see everyone is going to be fully satisfied at this marriage supper with the lamb and when i say fully satisfied i don't just mean in a physical sense as though you'll be full from from enjoying this amazing great meal but when i say fully satisfied i mean the deepest longings of your heart and soul will be filled. See, our good and gracious God wants to come in and He wants to completely satisfy you. Those desires that you have in there that are still unfulfilled, that, that the Lord says, I'm going to meet all of those and I'm going to fill you up in the most amazing marriage supper that you have ever imagined. The Lord's Supper, believe it or not, it is a taste of what is to come in our future. And our perfect Lord our God, whose name is faithful and true, also says this, I am wholly committed to getting you from where you are to where I'm going to bring you in that day. Amen? Amen. As these kids go ahead, y'all come on back in and, and find your families. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And in just a moment, we're going to go ahead and observe this ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And the kiddos are going to come in and find their families, their mamas, their grandmamas. We'll give them just a moment to do this. But part of what I want to remind you about, church, is that this Lord's Supper that we're going to partake in, it's a feast of gratitude. You ought to have a thankful spirit as we engage in this. I'm thankful for the body that was broken. I wish it never had to be that way. I'm thankful for the blood that was spilled. And oh, if there could have been another way, he, he would have done it. I want to remind you, church, that, that only the, the people that are only really worthy and capable of partaking in this meal are those of us who know that we are sinners and have been saved by grace. 
And so whether you're technically a member of this church or not, if you've had a salvation experience, if you've confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe in a different faith background or denomination, you're free to participate today. You're also free not to. We don't do this under compulsion. We sure don't do this because this is just what we do every Sunday, right? We do this to honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in as a moment as we do this, I, I pray that the Lord would shape you in whatever way that he needs to. I, I pray that in just a moment as we do this, that, that you would connect again with your Savior in a way that maybe you haven't since February, which is when we last engaged in this ordinance of the Lord's Supper. I, I pray that you remember the past that he's brought us from. And also that you're just as excited as I am about that future day that will come. Amen. As you walked into the room today, you probably saw back there, and I know our deacons worked hard to grab for you every single person, a little Ziploc baggie that has within it a little plastic cup. Did you get one of these? If you didn't, raise your hand. Our deacons are available to help you out. In the back here, in this back area, we need a little bit of help. As best we know how, our deacons worked really hard, and your staff came together to say, how can we do this in a way that is at least as safe as reasonably possible? And there will be a day when we go back to doing it maybe the way that we prefer but if you'll open up that little baggie inside everything that you need for the Lord's Supper is found within that little baggie you have a cup there that has a little surface piece of, of cellophane on top of it and in just a second there's a little plastic tab you just tear that off and in just a second we're going to peel back that top layer and you're going to find the wafer and after we do that, there's another little uh, seal right there over the juice, and we'll peel that back, and we'll take that juice. But before we get there, I want to read to you Jesus' words to his men on that night. In Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 14, Jesus, or Luke writes, And when the hour came, he, meaning Jesus, reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In verse 17, and he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so if you'd join me, just go ahead and peel back that top layer if you haven't done it already. And there's a little circular cracker or wafer there. It looks like this. Have you got it? Anybody need any more time? You need a little help? Sometimes they're a little bit tricky, and we can get you a second one if, if you need a second one. Jesus says, this is my body that will be broken for you. Take and eat. Thank you, Father. And also that night, they had already passed around the fruit of the vine or the goblet of wine in those days. And Jesus, I believe, he held it up before them. And again, he looked at them and he reminded them, as you just peel back this little cellophane over the juice, Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is going to be spilled for you. When you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me right there where you are? Holy Father, we say thank you. We say thank you for having your body broken for us and because of our sins. We say thank you for having your blood spilled. We say thank you for laying down your life. No one took it from you, but you voluntarily and willingly laid down your life so that broken men and women like me and others in this room could enjoy fellowship with you. 
We are eternally grateful to you, Lord Jesus, for the gift of salvation and for the forgiveness that you offer. Lord, help us to never be the same after this morning. If there's men and women that don't know, do not yet know you, Father, would you continue to draw them unto you? If you want to explore more, if, if you want to meet my Jesus, come to the front in just a moment. And we can share with you what it is that you need to do so that your eternity will be forevermore secure. Father, there may be some that just need to come and pray to you, whether right where they are, down front. This place is yours and this time is yours. This is a safe place to get right with your God. Father, would you continue to encourage those who need encouragement? Would you continue to lift our spirits that maybe we kind of dragged ourselves in here today? Lord, would you continue to show your compassion and your mercy on us? We love you. Beyond words, we love you. And it's in Jesus' perfect name that we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand as we continue to worship him?